Well, hey, good morning, Redeemer family. Thanks for joining us for The Daily Word. My name's Kyle. I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer. And if you remember, if you've been studying along with us last week, we were going through the book of Hebrews, and we went through uh, chapters 4 to chapter 9. And that's kind of the meat, the real uh, heavy-hitting parts of the book. Uh, We're getting towards the end here, but uh, really this last chapter here of the middle section, chapter 10, uh, is kind of another big meaty section that we want to remember as we walk away uh, and study this morning, uh, just an encouraging uh, theological truth of the sufficiency and the completeness of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And we remember in our study of the book of Hebrews that the author is making a comparison here that Jesus is better than everything else. And in in context of the Hebrew community, it has to do with everything in regards to the Old Covenant. So as we get in here, we remember that we've come through studies of Jesus being better than angels, being Jesus being better than Moses, Jesus being the guarantor of a better covenant, being better than the old priesthood, uh, being a better faith, a better resource for faith in general, uh, a better foundation. So as we get into Hebrews 10, well, as we start reading, it says, "...for the law, since it has only... Uh, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never be the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year. Uh, Make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer uh, have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible, mark this, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's interesting. Then why would God have established this system? Uh, You know, my understanding growing up was that if you were a Jew and you uh, upheld the Mosaic law and you uh, worshiped according to temple practice, that that would bring you salvation. And that's a misconception, and I want to clarify that right now as we study through the book of Hebrews. This makes it clear. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So if that's the case, then we have to go into an understanding that uh, the practice of those temple sacrifices had a different purpose, right? And that was a foreshadowing of the Messiah, was obedience to God, and it was to demonstrate contrition and obedience, but it was placing faith in the future and final sacrifice. This, these were just shadow and, 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 uh, and foreshadowings of things to come. So it says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Who's talking here? Well, this is Jesus talking. And it says, in the whole In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book that is written to do your will, O God. So he's making a comparison. You never really desired sacrifice. You set that up for as a provision for the future uh, comparison to the the messianic sacrifice. But this is Jesus saying, I come, and I come with my whole body, a body you have prepared for me. And then I said, I have come to do your will, O God, and that will was to lay down his life as a ransom for many. And he says, after saying, above all sacrifices and whole and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you've not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Again, replacing the old covenant, the temporary, with the new covenant, the permanent and that is the permanent work of salvation, the finished atoning work of salvation by Jesus. And he said, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that is such a beautiful truth, once for all sacrifice. Every priest, it says, stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And that is a, an important motif in, in the literature. Sitting down in that culture would mean finished work. It would mean the work is done. It would mean signifying rest, signifying authority. And so he's seated, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That is not made us 
uh, perfect sinless right now that has finished the work in us, made us perfect, the, te- uh, te- the te- uh, teleos, that this, this idea of finishing the work. That's the whole point. He has finished the work for all time, those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies for us, saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. You'll re- recognize this from Jeremiah. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law upon their hearts, and on their mind I will write them. And he then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So this is this beautiful idea of this finished atoning work of Christ. And then uh, he gets into this new this section here in verse 19, and uh, a new and living way, it says in my Bible title there, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new living way, which he inaugurated for us, through the veil that that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean and evil consciences in our bodies washed with pure water. This is demonstrating again the fullness of the finished work of Christ. Let us then draw near with confidence. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Paul is, er, I'm sorry, the author of Hebrews here is saying, I tip my hand there a little bit, uh, the author of Hebrews here is saying that we need to remember the finished work of Christ because it gives us confidence to press forward in this trying and, and uh, um, temptation-filled life. And when we're overcome by sin, when we stumble, when we uh, in this life do not live perfectly the way that we would want to, we know that we can hold fast to our confession because our confession is in the salvation, the atoning work of Christ, which is finished and perfect. So we go on there, uh, and let us consider then, this is how we do it, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So we we fellowship together, we bear each other's burdens, we we encourage each other to to go on to love and good deeds, and then we we don't forsake the gathering as, as the habit of some. Those who said, no, church isn't necessary, or the gathering together isn't necessary, I practice a, a solo faith, and, and the author here is saying no. He said, draw together even more so, fellow, fellowship even more so as the day draws near. Then this interesting last section here, he says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer a, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but rather a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Now this is a little bit of a scary section. And what does this mean? Now we have to remember context. We have to remember authorial intent. What is he talking about here? And we also remember comparing this to the rest of Scripture. Does this mean we can lose our salvation? No. Paul is talking, or, so the, again, the author of Hebrews here is talking to a community of people who, uh, there's some who believe and some who are questioning whether they should believe. There are those who are enlightened, those who are in the faith, and those who are uh, have been evangelized. And so the question is, He's, he's saying, he's, this is a warning to those who are flirting with the faith, who are examining it to see whether or not they want to give their heart to Christ. And he's saying, if you continue to sin willfully after receiving this knowledge, you are not just disobedient, you are apostate. And there's a difference between those who are apostate, who have rejected Jesus, versus those who've never heard, or those who are still considering the truth. And that's what he's talking about here. And this is really a temporal statement of if you exist in the state of apostasy, there is no the the Lord is not going to pursue you anymore. There is no there is no uh, continued uh, you know pursuit of of Christ in there. Now God can show grace and mercy to wherever he's to whoever he's going to. But what he's saying is those who are actively apostate actively rejecting the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but instead an expectation of judgment and the fiery fury. This is what he's saying is there's a there's an increased judgment in those who've heard the truth and who have rejected it, and he's warning this culture against that. And he says, like he says, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's talking to these Jews who know, you set aside the law of Moses, you reject that? According to two or three witnesses in the law, you're put to death. So even more so in the new covenant, you reject Christ, eternal punishment. Now, if you come again, it's the the state of apostasy. 
So you repent from that and come to faith, the Lord will forgive you. It's this not an unforgivable sin in, in the, in the um, eschatological sense. This is in the temporal sense, that you exist under the curse of the law, under the curse of eternal damnation if you reject Christ in the here and now. And so that's a, that's a, a warning from Paul here. He goes on, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Verse 32, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, right? He's encouraging them. Suffering's going to happen, partly being made by the public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly uh, becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have uh, for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. And then this quote, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and I will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. That's sort of a mashup of Isaiah and Romans there. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He says, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. So he's just, he's, he's, inc- this is the, the last little bit of apostolic encouragement here. Guys, I know it's tough. You've gone through it. Don't forget that you've already gone through this. The persecution is bad, yes, but we are not those who shrink back to destruction. We are those who have a faith that perseveres in the soul. And beloved, you and I are those who have a faith that perseveres in the soul. We have our trust and our foundation in the author and perfecter of our faith, as we'll see in Hebrews 12, the one who began and completed the good work. And we know that we have confidence that Jesus, who, comp- who began the good work in us, will be faithful to complete it until the day of redemption. And so the author here leaves us on that note, and we'll pick up tomorrow in uh, chapter 11, where he will lay for us some examples of great examples of faith throughout the history of the Mosaic Covenant and those uh, the, w- what we would call this, this great uh, Hall of Faith chapter in chapter 11. So we'll see you tomorrow for that. Thanks for watching The Daily Word.